Hello, it's Keith here, and this is the fifth in my Hello World series of Z80 tutorials. In this series, we create a very simple Hello World with a single assembly file, and we compile it onto different systems. And this week, we're going to be doing the Airline Enterprise, and, and this will work on the Enterprise 64 or 128. So we're going to create the for Hello World, and we're going to learn how we have to create a valid header file, how to compile it onto a disk image, load that disk image into our emulator, and run it. Anyway, first of all, let's just see it running. So we're compiling with Vasm today. I've got a batch file that automatically compiles it, but we'll look at the exact command line later. And then I've loaded this memory image, which prepares us to just run the file. So I just press enter here, and you can see hello world 323. Now this is our basic hello world example, which we've got just here. It just shows a message on the screen, but then we'll look at a more advanced example later, which is hello world with monitor. And if we just run that, we now have a dump of the system registers and some of the memory. So this is designed for early development and debugging. Okay, so that's our program. How do we actually create it? Well, the first thing with regards to creating a file for the enterprise is we need a small header to make our program executable. Now, the header is basically 16 bytes. It's pretty simple. The first byte needs to be a zero, then a five, and the five tells it that this is a machine code program. Then we need the length of the file. So we're calculating this within Vasm by taking a label for file start, which is after the header. You'll notice that the header has to start at F0 in memory because the program code itself starts at hexadecimal 100. Now the file end is of course after the final byte. And so by subtracting file end from file start, we can calculate the length here. Now, then we've got some unused bytes here and our file start actually occurs here, which is effectively at hexadecimal 100. Okay, so now we're in a position where we can start our code. Now because of the way that the enterprise works, we need to set a valid stack pointer. I've decided to point the stack pointer at hexadecimal 100. So effectively, the stack will start writing backwards from the start of the program. It won't overwrite the first byte of the program, but it will start going below hexadecimal 100. And that will give us around 128 bytes of available stack before it starts basically corrupting important stuff. But if you needed a bigger stack, you could put it somewhere else. But this is fine for most simple example programs. Okay, so now we've got a good starting point for our program, but on the enterprise, the screen won't be turned on by default. So we need to start the screen. Now, everything we do with the enterprise uses EXOS calls. Now, some assemblers and indeed the debugger, if I just load up the debugger here. Now you can see here, we've got a command EXOS0B. Now, B in hexadecimal is 11 and EXOS in this debugger is actually the RST6 command or RST48 just here. Now, RST48 or RST6 is actually a call to the EXOS functions of the operating system. So some assemblers and some source code and even this debugger here show this as the command EXOS, but I tend to use the actual command that traditional assemblers would call it. So I call it RST6, RST48. The following byte, in this case, byte 11 with our defined byte here, DB11, is actually the number here, which is 0B. So this command combination here is actually this function call here. So that's just something important that you need to understand when it comes to actually your code and how we call the operating system. So the first thing we want to do is we actually want to open a connection to the screen, because if we don't do this, we're not gonna be able to see anything. So how do we do this? Well, we need to open a stream. We're gonna open stream number 10 and we need to open it with command one. So we've got a one here and we've got our EXOS call here. And then we need to open the name of the screen. So I've got a, a pointer to the label EXOS screen name and you can see it's video colon, which is the internal name of the screen as according to EXOS. So this combination here will open our screen as stream 10. Now that we've opened stream 10, we now need to actually display the screen. We have a very special function to do this. It's quite complex and I'm not really going to go into the details. So this is the combination of bytes we need to write to the screen to turn on our screen. So this plus this will turn on our screen. If we didn't use these, if we disabled either one, we wouldn't get a working screen. So that's the absolute minimum we need. Now I've done a Hello World example before that did a lot of extra commands, but it, it seems like we can get away without those most of the time. So for this absolute minimal example, this is what we need to get Hello World working. Okay, so we've got a screen turned on. What do we want to do now? Well, we want to be able to show characters. To do this, we use EXOS again. The RST48 again here is the EXS call. And this time we want to use command seven, which writes a single byte to the channel. Now the channel is in the accumulator, so we want channel 10. 
We could use any channel here. We could change this to channel 11. That would work fine. As long as we use the same channel here, 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 and here, that would work just fine. Um, and then this will write the byte in B to the screen. So I've got this print char routine, but com for compatibility, I'm using the accumulator. So we just need to move the accumulator into B and then move channel 10 into the accumulator before running this call here. But this print char command will show the accumulator to the screen. So we use this to run a print string command. Our print string command is very simple. It reads in from HL. You can see us calling it here, pointing to message. And the message is just here. And all it does is it reads in each byte, sees if we've got a character 255. If we have, we return. If not, it runs the print chart to show that character to the screen. And it just keeps repeating until it's finished. Now, that's how we do a print chart. But we will also want to, in occasions, start a new line just to keep things nice and neat. Well, how do we do a new line on the enterprise? Well, all we do, print a character 13, which is the carriage return command. And then a character 10, which is the line feed command. And the combination of these two together on the enterprise will start a new line. And that's all we need to do to create a new line on the enterprise. So that's how we do our hello world. That's really all there is to it. Once we've finished, we just stop the CPU with a disable interrupt and halt, just so we can see the result. And that's all it takes to get this example onto the screen. Now, we do have a more advanced example here. It's based on the same code. All, all that's been added is we're now including some extra modules here, reading them in. These were created in my multi-platform series, and these create a very basic monitor. We can call the command monitor to show the current registers of the system. Alternately, we can use this memdump direct command, specify an address and a number of bytes, and we will see that address to the screen. For example, if I just change this to 00100, we can now see the contents of the memory on the screen. And this is the memory that made up our program code. I think this here is the actual selection of the stack pointer at hexadecimal 0100 here. I think that's right. Anyway, you can see here we've got the registers and the memory dump. So we can now use these for developing other things and for testing code that we're working on if we want to. OK, so that's how we can write code that will actually do the job. But of course, how do we actually assemble this? Well. Of course, we need an assembler. You can download my development tools, the ones you've seen me use today, and hopefully that will do everything for you. But if you really want to go to scratch, then we can, of course, do things ourselves. Now, I use Vasm, which is an assembler that's very, very good for Z80. But um, this is the command switches I use. I'm using the old style syntax. And we need to specify a source file, which we do just here. We need to specify a destination. And we're calling our program program.com here in this example. And we're writing it to a folder. Now, I'm also specifying some symbols here. These are not needed for the basic Hello World, but they are needed for the monitor tools because they're a bit more advanced. And I'm outputting a listing file, which is just for debugging. You don't need that. Of course, we're disabling case sensitivity and popping up warnings just in case we've made a mistake. Check labels. We'll notice if we do something like that, where halt is now a label. Well, it's likely that that's actually a mistake. So it will warn us of those kind of suspicious things where a command is in the label position. Anyway, that's how we compile our code. Now, in that example, the code has been compiled to a folder. Now, you can you see the EP128 emulator has a virtual file system, which emulates a physical drive via the file system. It's quite complicated to set up. And if you go to my website, there is a link just here, which gives some details of how to set it up. I'm not going to go into detail on it here, because hopefully you can figure it out yourself. And as I say, it's, all, it's already documented in a better way than I think I can do today. So if, if you want to get that set up, please look into that yourself. Um, if you've got it set up, then all you need to do is type run quote file colon program.com file points to file IO. So it's again, it's a stream. And then we just hit enter here. We need to have two quotes, otherwise it sulks. And then you can see we run our program. And what I do is I actually have a memory snapshot with that command pre-typed in so that I can compile my program and run it absolutely as fast as possible. It always appears off, win off screen, though. So that's how it starts up because of that memory snapshot. And that saves me a little bit of time. Now, alternatively, I do have a floppy disk version, which is very similar. Effectively, all we're doing is we're converting the folder build enterprise, which is what the file I was pointing to as the base of the emulated drive. And I'm converting it to a disk image 
called disk.img with a tool called BFI. Now, BFI is a, quite an old tool now. It was used as part of a Windows XP recovery disk toolkit, but it's free to download. It does the job perfectly. So that's what I would recommend for creating enterprise disk images. Now, if we start our enterprise disk image, we now just need to run program.com right, with no file colon and it will again hopefully run fine. It's a little bit slower though. So I would suggest if you're doing a lot of development, you want to get that file IO working because it will save you a few seconds every time you test. And if you're running this dozens of times in your development, it's gonna end up saving you quite a lot of time. Now, as well as being able to type runprogram.com, if we save our program as start, then we can just press F1 and that will run our program as well. And so what I'm doing in this example is I've actually got some code that once the program has compiled okay, I'm copying it from program.com to start just as a secondary option as a way to start the program. And that will allow for auto playing. So that's something I definitely recommend you do if you're wanting to develop a game and release it. So that's how we can compile our disk image. How do we actually start the emulator? Well, of course, it's entirely up to you. There's a lot of options. But what I'm doing here is I am loading in the config here because I have two configs one for starting the emulator with file IO and one for starting the emulator with a real disk image. Now, the other thing I'm doing is I'm loading in a memory snapshot. You can see here, I've got a snapshot saved here, which has got all the commands pre-typed in. And of course the actual disk selection is stored in this config file here. So that's what's doing the work of getting everything set up with the disk already in the drive. I'm also disabling OpenGL, but that's actually relating to getting this working on Windows 10. I was trying to use it in emulators on Windows 10. I actually use Windows 7, but it wasn't working very well with OpenGL enabled. So I've disabled OpenGL just as a compatibility thing, just in case uh, other people using my dev tools are having trouble. But of course, you don't need to use my dev tools. And if your machine works fine with OpenGL, by all means, turn that on. Okay, so that's basically it. So that's really all it takes to get a program compiled and working on the Elan Enterprise. The Enterprise is a nice system. It's got this quite powerful operating system which allows it to do some things for us. But if we want to do things directly ourselves, it's pretty good for that as well. So it's definitely a great system. And hopefully what you've seen here is enough to get you started if you want to really take things in your own direction. But if you want to learn more about the Enterprise, I've got my own dev tools and you can download all the samples and sources from my platform specific series and my multi-platform series on the Enterprise. So if you want a bit of um, some pre-designed stuff, you're welcome to go and have a go with that. And of course, check out my Grime Z80 series, which was a multi-platform program that did also work on the enterprise. Anyway, I hope you found this interesting. Thanks for watching today and goodbye.